Hi, everybody. Okay, so let's, um, let's start on the proof of the classification of finite abelian groups. So the first thing that we're going to prove is this converse to Lagrange's theorem for abelian groups. If we have a finite abelian group of order n, and we have a prime p that divides n, then g has an element of order p. Um, so the, a number of the proofs that we're going to do in this stage are inductive. And the idea is that we're going to take a, our group G, which is abelian. And because it's abelian, every one of its subgroups is normal. And so if we have a non-trivial subgroup H, we can look at H and G mod H, both of which are going to have order less than G. So whatever property we're trying to establish, we can assume holds for those two groups because they're smaller than G and we're working by um, induction. And then if we know something for H and G mod H, we can try to figure out something about G. So we're going to assume that, um, that if, uh, if, if we have a group, if G, so here's our inductive hypothesis. Assume that if G is abelian, and order n, order k, and p divides k, then g has an element of order p. And we're going to assume this is true, holds for all k less than n, where n is the order of the group that we're interested in. And we have to check, first of all, the trivial case, but if n equals 1, then G is the trivial group, and it's certainly true that if a prime divides the order of the trivial group, then this holds because no primes divide the order of the trivial group. So this is automatically true. And so we adopt this inductive hypothesis that I've marked here. Now, we take our abelian group of order n, and the first thing that might happen is that it has no, sub, no proper subgroups at all. But we already know what happens in that case. If G has no proper subgroups, then that means that every non-trivial element every non-identity element of G generates G. And that only happens if G is prime G has prime order. So in other words, G is ZP, and if it has prime order, there's only one prime which divides that order, namely P, and G has an element of that order because it's cyclic of order P. So in this case, we have uh, our result in this case. So now we can assume that G has a proper subgroup. So if G has a proper subgroup, there are two possibilities. We know that the order of G is the order of this proper subgroup times the index of the proper subgroup by Lagrange's theorem. And if P divides the order of H, then by the since the order of H is, um, is smaller than the order of G, we know by our inductive hypothesis that um, H has an element of order P. Um, and if H has an element of order P, that's also an element of order G, uh, an element of order P and G. So G has an element of order P. But it could happen that P doesn't divide the order of H, but instead it divides the index, G mod H. And so let's worry about that case. So in that case, G mod H has order divisible by P. And the order of G mod H is less than the order of G. So G mod H has an element of order P. And the question we have to worry about is, how do we get from an element in G mod H, which is a, an element of the factor group of order P, how do we get from that to an element of G of order P? And that takes a little bit of work. 
So the strip we we know from our inductive hypothesis that we have a coset A H, which is an element of order P. And that what, what that means in the fact this is in the factor group G mod H. So what's true is that in the factor group, A H has order P. So A H to the P is the identity element in the factor group H, but A is not in H, because if A were in H, then A H would be the identity already. So that's an element that we have. We have an element such that it, the coset to the pth power is h, but a is not in h. Now we do a little bit of algebra in the, in the old-fashioned sense. So we're going to use the fact that um, the order of h is not divisible by p, because if it were divisible by p, we would have already dealt with that in our first case. And so we can take Euclid's algorithm and we can apply it to the order of h and to p and get an expression x times the order of h plus y times the order of p is equal to 1. And now we take our element a, which has the property, let me just remind you, that a to the p is in h, but a is not in h. Because to say that a to the p equals h, this is the same thing as saying that a to the p is in h. And now we look at what happens if we raise a to the first power, a to the 1, but we write it as a to the x times the order of h plus yp. And we regroup that. So it's <clears throat> a to the order of h, which we call b, to the x, then a to the p to the y. And this is b to the x, times a to the p to the y. <clears throat> but a to the p is in h, so this is in h. So we have that a is in b to the x times h. But a is not in h, so b to the x is not in h. Um, and it would also be the case that if B was the, maybe I skipped ahead a little bit. So if B were the identity, then from this equation, we would have A equals A to the P Y. This is if B is equal to the identity. We'd have A is A to the P Y, but <clears throat> that's in H. And that isn't true because A is not in H. So B is not the identity. But if you take b and raise it to the pth power, you get a to the p to the order of h. And here's, I guess, maybe the coolest trick in this. a to the p is an element of h. So a to the p to the order of h has to be the identity. Because if you raise an element of a finite group to the order of the group, you always get the identity. So what that tells us is that b to the p must be the identity. So we've constructed an element b, which is not the identity, but its pth power is the identity, and that means b has order p. And actually, we kind of gave a rule for how to construct it, just to remind you, we took our coset AH, which had the property that AH to the P is equal to H. So A to the P is in H, but at the same time, A is not in H. And then we let B be A to the order of H, and we showed that B has order P. Because on the one hand, if you raise it to the pth power, um, you know that you get the identity because it's a to the p to the order of h. But you know that it's not the identity because if it, if, if by itself, because if a to the h were the identity, that would force a to belong to h, and it doesn't. So with that result, we get a, um, a result about uh, abelian groups of prime power order, namely, if every element of a group has order a power of a fixed prime, 
then the order of the group total is a power of that prime. And conversely. And the reason for this is, um, first of all, if the order of G is a power of P, then if G is an element of that group, the order of that element has to divide the order of the group, so it has to be a prime power. That's the Lagrange's theorem direction. It's, so to speak, the easy direction. The hard direction would be if the order of G is a power of P for all G, um, suppose um, the order of the big group G is divisible by N, let's say by Q, where Q is not equal to P. Well, that can happen because then G has an element of order Q by our previous result. But that contradicts our assumption. So if you have an abelian group and every element in that group has order of power of P, then the group itself has order of power of P. I've said this a number of times, but in fact, this result is true for finite groups in general. You don't need the abelian hypothesis. However, proving that requires more ideas, and we won't get to that until the end of the course. But at least we have it for abelian groups. Okay, I'll stop here and pick up the next step in the proof in the next video.